Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this meeting of the Planning Committee. I'm Councillor Mike Lilly. I'll be chair for this evening's uh, proceedings. Uh, welcome to everybody and to members of the public. Um, we do have written, we do have matters of procedure, so I'm going to have to go through a whole list of these. I'm sorry, but uh, uh, action in the event of an emergency. There are no practice alarms planned for this evening. So if an alarm sounds, please evacuate the town hall by going down the main entrance, with the, sorry, the main staircase or the back staircase to the high street and then to the car park behind the town hall in St. Runwall Street. This meeting is being live streamed to the council's YouTube page and will be available after the meeting. Please would speakers use microphones at all times and speak directly into the microphone and would participants Please mute the mi microphones when not speaking. Introductions now. Members of the committee and officers will introduce themselves now, starting from my left, please. I'm Councillor Helen Chua, St. Anne's and St. John's Ward. Councillor Mike Holt from St. Anne's and St. John's Ward, subbing for Councillor Lynn Barton. Councillor Sam McCarthy representing Shrub End Ward. Martin Warns, Beer Church Ward. Chris Pearson, Labour Councillor for Beer Church. Councillor Robert Davidson, Mersey and Pie Fleet Ward, uh, substituting for Councillor Roger Mannion from Tiptree. Councillor Jackie McLean, Mark Stanley Ward. Nigel Chapman, Rural North Ward. Nadine Calder, Principal Planning Officer. Eleanor Moss, Principal Planning Officer. Chris Harden, Senior Planning Officer. And Sam Cairns, Development Manager. Carmichael, Democratic Service so. Thank you, everyone. Members of the committee may use electronic devices to access their meeting papers, and visitors are welcome to use mobile phones and other devices, including cameras. But please use them discreetly, set them to silent, and do not use voice or camera flash functions. We may have a break at eight o'clock, subject to the items remain there. There are toilets on every floor in the building and an induction loop in this room. Whilst determination of a plan application is not a quasi-judicial process, unlike certain licensing functions carried out by the local authority, it is a formal administrative process involving the application of national and local policies. Reference to legislation and case law, as well as rules of procedure, rights of appeal, and the expectation that people will act reasonably and fairly. All involved in these decisions should remember that the possibility that an aggrieved party may seek a judicial review and or complain to the Ombudsman on grounds of maladministration or a breach of the authorities code. Uh, and as an extra on this is conduct of meetings. The meeting procedure rules in the constitution provide for that the chairman, which is myself, may disallow or terminate any public participation, which is scurrilous, vexatious, improper, irrelevant, or otherwise objectionable. If a member of the public interrupts the meeting, the chairman or chairperson, there should be, may issue a warning. And if the interruption continues, the chairperson will order the removal of the member of the public. In the event of a general disturbance, which in the opinion of the chairperson renders the due and orderly dispatch of business impossible, uh, the chairperson may without question adjourn the meeting for such period as the chairperson in the exercise of absolute discretion shall consider expedient. A bit of power at long last. Uh, and this all leads to something that happened a couple of nights ago where there was a bit of trouble in the interns. So we now move on to the, oh no, sorry, remember, Rossi uh, White. No. So we have substitutions we've heard tonight. 
Councillor Davison, for Councillor Mannion. And I think we all wish uh, Councillor Mannion all the best for his opportunity that's coming up. Um, no other substitutions. Councillor Hogg for Councillor Limbartem. Item three, urgent items. Any urgent items? Robert? None, Chair. Declarations of interest. Yeah, item four, declarations of interest. Any declarations of interest? Councillor McLean. I have a pecuniary interest in item one. My husband does business dealings with the applicant. Will you be leaving the meeting for that item? Then you'll be coming back for the rest of that. Thank you very much. Anybody else? If anybody else says something comes up, you can mention it uh, at that time if you think about it. Thank you. Item five, have your say. If anyone has a petition they wish to present to me or on any of the items on the agenda this evening, please do so now. No, there's no one. So we have the minutes of the meeting held on the 8th of December, 2022. Are there any points of accuracy that need raising or inaccuracy, in fact? We do love a full stop in the wrong place. No? Because I asked them for a proposer and a seconder, and then we have a show of hands. Propose. Proposed by Councillor Helen Chow, a seconder, Councillor Tate. All those in favour of the approval? Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you, Irish. Have your say. So on the applications tonight, we basically have on 7.1, we have Matt Free as a speaker against and we have a public for dr jeremy harrell who's the agent for the application can i remind people that um because of procedures and everything that we have allowed mr free to speak at a late notice of that because in the in the terms of transparency and democracy but we would like people to register beforehand so we know who's coming especially with the security uh, issues that are going to happen in the next three months. So if you have to come again, please uh, bear that in mind for us. But thanks for coming anyway. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, so on 7.2, which is Hashwing Farm in Wakes Cone, uh, we don't have any speakers at all, do we? Oh, sorry, we have... Lisa Spence, the public for, Stephen Barr, public against. Uh, and on 7.3, same issue but different uh, application, Hashwick Farm, Manviewers Road, we have Stephen Barr against and Lisa Spence for. And there's nobody else. Oh, you've got absolutely. Uh, and on 7.4, uh, we have land adjacent to three Highfield Drive. We have public against Richard Flower and the public for Michael Smith, who's the agent. And councillors, Lynn Barton, and I think there'll be a statement read by somebody, Myself. yourself. And Councillor Willits is on Zoom. Is I can't see him, he's very quiet. Oh, okay. Councillor Willits did register to speak. I can't see him at this exact moment. He said he might not. Be here when we get to that point, but fair enough, it's just popped down. So on 7.5, there are no speakers, Byron Avenue, in Colchester, and 7.6, Nero Court, Napier Road, there are no speakers for or against that one there. So, considering that 7.5 and 7.6, we don't have any speakers for or against. Uh, is are we happy to take that on block or does anybody want to call those applications out to speak on it? So on 7.5, 7.6, could we have a show of hands that we take it on block, please? No. That's unanimous. That's unanimous chair. Thank you very much. Yep. Yeah. So I can confirm that these items have been determined in line with the officer recommendation in the report and amendment sheet, and there will not be further discussion on those items. Any interested parties in attendance for those items 
my wish to leave now. Thank you very much. So now we move on to, oh, let me turn this back up, otherwise we're going to, to 7.1, uh, land south of Copper Village Hall School Road and Eleanor Moss to present, please. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, everybody. I'm just going to share my screen, but whilst that fires up, just do some housekeeping. Uh, members might be aware that a further letter of objection was sent via email and there's a further um, objection on file. So they've been indexed online if you've not had a chance to view those yet. I have reviewed them and don't consider any new material planning considerations to be raised, uh, but you are welcome to view them uh, via our online website as well. So the proposal is for a rural exception scheme. Sorry, it's not showing. Hang on. My apologies. Right. Hopefully that's got it working. So, yes, back with item 7.1, rural exception site at Copford. So the application site rely, uh, relates to this uh, piece of land outlined in red, which is on the screen now. This is to the east of School Road. To the north is the Village Hall. To the south is a ribbon of development and further to the west is also similar ribbon development. Further to the east is a network of public rights of way, which are shown in sort of the pink dashed line, which connects to the Pitts Wood. Uh, the next slide we have here is the proposed block plan for the proposal, which is uh, in a similar sort of ribbon development, which is in the existing area. The access is taken quite centrally off the site with around 22 car parking spaces proposed at the rear. Obviously, this is quite a large amount of car parking, but it is proposed that this is shared with the village hall adjacent mm -hmm. so that any surplus parking can be uh, to the rear of this site. The affordable units of which there are five, there are three one bed houses and two two bed houses are there towards the north of the site. So showing on the left of the screen 
and the open market houses of which there are two four bed are shown on the right of the screen so towards the south of the site adjacent to number 97 school road so here are the proposed elevations of the affordable units uh, they will be constructed of natural timber, larch to be specific, and natural slate, which are also conditioned. And we are conditioning uh, the window detailing as well to ensure that they do look acceptable within the street scene. Uh, this is the proposed elevations for the open market aspect of the scheme. Um, these also come with detached garages, uh, similar materials as well. So these are some street scene elevations which demonstrate the affordable homes and the open market homes which are proposed to cross subsidize the affordable housing element of the screen uh, of the scheme with the private drive in the center of the site and there you can see those two uh, two garages between the open market homes and number 97 to the right hand side and the village hall will be further to the left hand side of the street scene. So we are looking uh, to the east here standing from School Road. And I'll just take you through some site photos. Obviously, we did a site visit earlier this week, uh, but this is standing at School Road looking towards the east. So Pittswood further in the background and the open um, fields further in the background too with the public right of way in the background as well. So this is looking slightly towards uh, the northeast and there you can see in the corner, the left-hand side of your screen, the village hall with its uh, red door there as well. And this is looking towards the east, southeast with number 97 there in the right-hand side of your screen. Um, just the gable end of it there. And this is standing at School Road, uh, looking up, looking towards the south. Uh, so there you can see the existing ribbon development on both sides of the road with the uh, uh, application site towards the left side. And this is looking up towards the north. Uh, so you can just make out the village hall there on the right with the little red door um, and then ribbon development on the opposite side of the applica application site as well still on school road and this is opposite the application site just demonstrating the existing residential development here and my final slide I brought up um, the allocation site so you can see it in the wider setting um, so hopefully you can see the yellow highlight towards the bottom of that. So that is the application site and you can see that it is adjacent to the settlement boundary, which is shown in black there. As a rural exception scheme, it's not allocated, but policy DM8 supports rural exception schemes adjacent to settlement boundaries, and therefore this is considered to be acceptable in principle. Um, on balance, the report takes the uh, exercise which demonstrates that the benefits of the scheme outweigh the harm and therefore is recommended for approval. Happy to take any questions. Any questions for Eleanor at this moment? So now we're going to have your say. If I could call Mr. Free to the microphone, please. Yeah, hi there. Can you hear me okay? Oh, sorry. I didn't realise who's on the... Uh... Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm on, I'm on Zoom. Yes. I can't quite... The sound's not very good. So, Mr. Free, you have three minutes to speak. The bell will go after two. Okay. Then you'll have a minute left after that. So, when you're ready, please proceed. <coughs> OK, well, firstly, thank you for allowing me to address the planning committee. Uh, the proposal fails to properly address a number of key policy considerations and lacks sufficient evidence to support the development. The site uh, excuse me for a moment, Mr. Free, that, uh, yes. uh, just sorry for the interruption, that we, yeah. we can't actually hear you very well. Right, OK. Um, so we're, we're trying to... Yeah. If you could turn your microphone up there and we're yes, trying I'm to adjust... 
I've got it right up. Can you, can you hear me okay now? Okay, well, we'll have to proceed, uh, so um, one, please one proceed. Second. Let, me, let me just try again this in one second. Just bear with me. Can you hear me okay? Are we happy, members? Yes, please proceed. We'll start again then. Uh, so your time will start when you're you're ready to start again. Okay. Um, the proposal fails to properly address a number of key policy considerations and lacks sufficient evidence to support the development. The site sits in within the half Cockford community countryside and quickly outside of the village settlement boundary. Although the Cockford with East Top neighbourhood plan is yet to proceed to referendum, I don't think it can be ignored. The adopted plan will have the same weight as planning policy documents prepared by Culture Borough Council. This application relies on a rural exception site which should only be used in rare circumstances where there is support from the local community and Paris Council due to the benefit of their housing outweighing the damage it would cause. I reviewed the 2020 housing needs survey, noting that it only had a response rate of 25% and therefore represents the views of a minority of residents. Of the 25% of residents who responded, there was some support, 69%, for a small development of four to eight homes, primarily for affordable housing. More importantly, this question lacks sufficient detail to be relevant to rural exception site. This is crucial, as the question does not ask whether residents would be in support of a small development that is to be built outside of the identified village settlement boundary and green open space. Respond, respondents were asked this question and the support would plummet. Destroying green open space and far reaching views across open countryside in the heart of Cockford directly conflicts the vision and objectives of the local planning policies and the neighbourhood plan. There are far more suitable sites in Cockford for housing which would not lead to the loss of green open space. New housing to meet local clients need not damage the rural character of Cockford that the neighbourhood plan strives to protect. The proposal runs contrary to core policy ENV1, which is highlighted in the committee report. Helena Moss makes reference to the MPPF and uh, paragraph 78 notes that such rural housing should be located where it will enhance or maintain the vitality of rural communities. Emerging neighbourhood plan states that pits, woods, and surrounding open aspect views have a high local value and contribute to the nature of the parish. If any housing is permitted on this site, then it will not enhance or maintain the vitality of rural communities. Policy H4 in the adopted plan and policy DMA in the emerging local plan support affordable housing development in rural exception sites. However, these sites must, uh, the, uh, however, these must be sites that are adjacent to existing village settlement boundaries and address a local need that has been robustly demonstrated by way of local housing needs survey and developed and supported by the Paris Council on behalf of the residents. The Housing Needs Survey has not asked the correct questions and therefore this application is not supported by the residents of Cockford. To summarise, the proposal fails to meet rural exception site principle and criteria, fails to align with the Cockford and the Eastport Neighbourhood Plan, and relies heavily on a Housing Needs Survey that is outdated and misleading when attempting to apply it to a rural exception site. I suppose I'm just asking for your support to either Refer this planning application to allow the correct evidence to be established so that you can make an informed decision or refuse this application. And thanks for your time. Thank you very much. Helen, would you like to respond to some of those points that Mr. Free made? I think, I think we'll take the speaker first, then we can get on to that. So can we have the, the speaker for Dr. Jeremy Harrell? Agent, please. So you have three minutes. Uh, after two minutes, the bell will sound, and you have one minute remain after that. Start when you're ready, please. Sorry, just to interrupt. Could I ask you to bring the microphone a bit closer to you, yourself, please? Because so we can so we can pick out nice and clear. Thank you. 
you can start again, I think, uh, best way. Try and speak a bit louder as well, please. Thank you. Excuse me, I'm sorry, big pun, but apparently your microphone isn't working, so it's not being picked up to, to record uh, and over the YouTube. Test one, two, one, two. So we're just going to see where we are. We'll allow you to start again. I'm sorry. This is a, this is technology for you, isn't it? Yes, apologies for that. Do you want to try the sound help microphone if you don't mind? I'm not standing and dancing. Uh, the, the lyrics for the character like you will come up in a minute. Okay. We'll be disappointed. So if you want to start a game, please. We'll... Okay. Thank you. Can I? Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you for your patience. Uh, 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 Green Street, as it's now become known, is a proposed rural exception site. It's a small development of seven dwellings, providing local homes for local people in Cotford. It's a mixed use tenure solution of affordable shared ownership and open market housing. I'm reliably informed when built, some of these homes will be the first of their type delivered in Cotford for over 20 years. Green Street, directly responds to the housing needs survey commissioned by Cotford Parish Council. That was the first survey undertaken in over 10 years. It was undertaken by the Rural Community Council of Essex, who found 22 local residents in Cotford in need of rehousing. That translates to eight homes for existing Cotford residents. Five of these identified homes are to be accommodated within Green Street. In the absence of this scheme, for some Cotford residents, their future prospects of owning or indeed renting a new home are uncertain. This rural exception site provides a solution for those people. Other noteworthy aspects of the scheme are that it delivers a net biodiversity gain, accommodates 22 off-street parking spaces, delivers generous gardens, is within walking distance of both local services and the local primary school. It's on a bus route, and it's immediately adjacent a busy and well-serviced Cotford Village Hall. The need for local homes 
for local people in Cotford has been identified. With your support this evening, these homes can be delivered over the next 18 months. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Eleanor, would you like to respond to any points raised, please? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, if I've missed any points that Mr. Free raised, um, that you picked up on, feel free to just ask me and I can try and respond, uh, but it was a little difficult to hear, uh, sadly. Um, so in terms of the Copford neighbourhood plan, there have been concerns raised um, that the application is being determined before the adoption of the Copford neighbourhood plan. Uh, this is correct because the Cotford Neighbourhood Plan is still in draft form and it's currently at examination. Uh, so currently we don't know whether the Cotford Neighbourhood Plan will look as it does in its current draft form or whether it will change. Therefore, it's given limited weight at this moment in time. Um, there is a policy SE1 in the Cotford Neighbourhood Plan, which does state new development must avoid loss of greenfield agricultural land. And this is greenfield agricultural land of the application site. But then there is also policy SE4B in the Cotford Neighbourhood Plan, which requires sufficient affordable homes for parish residents and supports on rural exception schemes. Regardless of how the Copford neighbourhood plan uh, progresses and in what form, it won't change the wording of our adopted policy DM8, affordable housing, which provides support for rural exception schemes. So I don't believe that there is a uh, concern determining this application prior to any sort of adopted Copford neighbourhood plan. Um, there's also support in the national uh, in the NPPF for rural exception schemes. Therefore, there will always be the support in terms of local and national policy for rural exception schemes. Um, and the broad uh, protection of the countryside is rolled back for these rural exception sites. Hence, why they're called rural exception sites. Um, um, I think concern was also raised regarding the housing needs survey, and I might be repeating some of what Dr. Harrell said here, but as far as I'm aware, it, the uh, housing needs survey was conducted in 2020 in the summer uh, by the Rural Community Council of Essex, who are an independent charity who found that there was a requirement of eight affordable homes in Cotford. Um, and this scheme proposes to provide five, which will be made available for uh, local residents per the Section 106 agreement. Um, I don't think I have any more to add, but like I say, if I missed anything, feel free to let me know. Well, thank you very much. But just to clarify um, uh, one of the points, the, um, the affordable housing, um, should be for really the hopefully the the Cofford residents who, who want to live there. Is there a way first that we can guarantee that Cofford residents who need a house will be the first to apply for these houses, and then if they're not taken up, they could go into the the, the local register for other people. But hopefully, it'd be for local residents to take first. Yes, that's correct, Chair. So in terms of the section one hundred and six. Um, so I'll just do a brief outline of what we'd be aiming to get signed. So it'd be 80% affordable rent. So that would be four of the affordable houses and 20% shared ownership. So that would be one of them. And a requirement to uh, obtain those would be a local connection. So whether that be someone living in the parish, someone that has worked in the parish for a considerable time, for example. So those uh, people would be up first. Um, and then we might as well have trigger points as well. If no one came forward, it could then be offered to neighbouring parishes first, um, but it would trickle down that way. So it'd be offered to residents of the Cockford and East Thorpe first. Oh, that's great. That's really good. Thank you very much. Panel, over to you. 
Any questions for Eleanor, please? Councillor Tate. Could you speak directly into your microphone, please? Since Thanks. Uh, Lee, I think uh, just, if you want to hold on for a second, because we're going to have a short adjournment of five minutes while we try and sort out the sound. It's not very good. We are we are ready to go. So please, uh, Councillor Tate, off you go. Uh, yeah, I just had. Oh, that is working. I just had a regarding the um, parking at the rear for the use of the village hall overspill. I just thought that was a bit. It seemed a bit out of keeping with the housing development. But yeah, thank you. Um, so I will uh, say that the additional car parking has come from the applicant rather than a requirement as part of the scheme from the council. Um, I believe it came about through discussions with the wider community and concerns that the car park at the village hall can become full and therefore offered additional car parking spaces to release a bit of the burden when the village car park was full. Um, so that's how it came about. I hope that helps. Anybody else, please? Councillor Pearson. Thank you, Chair. Um, my question was just to uh, Ms Moss, if we know when the housing needs survey was carried out and whether there is any life for such a survey. In other words, does it 
does it cease to be relevant after a period of time? Thank you. So in terms of the housing needs survey, I think that was uh, completed in July 2020. Um, I've checked the guidelines to see when a new one would be required, um, and there isn't anything that states how often they need to be repeated. Um, so there'll be nothing to say that we need a new one before our next plan period to be undertaken. Um, this has also been used as evidence in the emerging Copford neighbourhood plan, and therefore we would say it's in date since it's being used as evidence base for that document, which is still emerging. Um, so I wouldn't consider it to be out of date, and we don't have any mechanism which says it sort of becomes out of date either in a certain period of time. Hope that helps. Councillor Davison. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, Ellen, uh, can I just clarify, please, the drawing on the uh, printed documents doesn't come up to number 87, whereas your picture on the screen does. Which one takes precedent, please, or which one's accurate? Sorry, can you just uh, repeat which 87 on 97 on this one? So that this one there is number 97. I hope that's President Davison, you need your microphone on. They're still the going. There you go. There we go. <laughs> the red line on your presentation came right up to the house boundary, and the black line doesn't. Yes, so the, the red line relates to the application site um, and then the black line, which I showed before, which I can show you again, relates to the settlement boundary. So they're two separate lines, but essentially the red line, um, just shown in black on this one, um, is the application site, um, which is in ownership of the applicant. So it probably just comes up to the boundary of 97 and then the settlement boundary shown in black in the presentation earlier. Um, is the settlement boundaries in the adopted plan. Thank you for that clarification. Um, I'd just like to say, Chairman, I'm very supportive of rural housing and exception sites. It's worked so well in a lot of the villages in Colchester. Um, it gives people a chance uh, to stay in their community. And I hope, uh, uh, as far as the cascading goes, I was just a little bit concerned that obviously Copper's right on the edge of uh, Stanway, for example, which is a massive village now. Uh, and I think it's important that the rural villages, the smaller ones, get a chance before the largest, larger ones. Um, apart from that, uh, I'd like to support it. I think it's a great scheme. We, I wonder whether there was any opportunity, though, to have a, a, a public access footpath uh, through the, along the road to the car parking area and out of the back. When we went to our site visit, there were people walking on the field and it's a well-worn well track. Uh, and that would give people an access from from the main road as well. It um, it, it shouldn't be it shouldn't um, be a problem for the developer. I wouldn't have thought. Oh, it sounds like a good idea. Is that possible at all? Uh... Yes, thank you. So it certainly is possible. So I'd suggest we write a uh, pre-commencement condition which states that a public access point shall be provided to the east of the site. Um, which should then go towards the um, public rights of way and details should be submitted to the local planning authority in writing and the agreed details retained in perpetuity um, and the reasons so that there can be pedestrian access to the site. Oh, sorry, one more thing. If it was of concern to members, we could also stipulate or not stipulate, but not include Stanway in the section 106 uh, for the cascading mechanism. Are we happy with that, uh, Stavis? I think it's great. Thank you very much. I know that for the 106 agreements, there's quite a lot of money going to, to Copford uh, Parks and Rec, £50,000, quite a lot. So, Council Chapman, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, like Councillor Davidson said, uh, I too am great supporter of exception sites, and this, this does seem to me to, to fit the bill. Um, we made the site visit, and, and as I say, I was very impressed with the site. And I think it's, it's an excellent position for a re exception site. Um, much has been made about the 
housing needs survey uh, being sort of out of date. I mean, these things always have a, a natural time to, before these plans are, are materialised. So I don't think there's anything untoward about, about two and a half years uh, for that. So I've got no concerns about that. Um, the, there's one other thing I wanted to say was the... Um, yeah, I, do, I also I do share that concern. I think we, we've probably covered, covered now about about the cascading it out. Um, it would be better if it could be, um, as as has been agreed, I guess now for for, for the um, rural villages rather than uh, for the uh, bigger conurbation. So presumably, is that what happens about the town centre itself, the the urban part of the town? Does that get included as well? Maybe that ought to be included as well. I don't know how how these things work. Actually, I've always assumed it was just went through rural villages. That it, certainly from my perspective in the in my patch it's just gone through, through the neighborhood villages so I, I would can I question that but, I, but with the, whatever the answer to that is I'm happy to propose that we do accept the uh, um, application chairman yes so thank you so in terms of the section 106 first and foremost it will be offered to um, residents with a local connection that live in the parish for example and then if uh, there weren't any people coming forward it goes it, it would be offered to neighboring parishes uh, potentially with the exception of Stanway so more of the rural parishes East Thorpe for example so it wouldn't include the urban center thank you Councillor Warren please thank you chair um yeah I'm I'm broadly supportive of um rural exception sites and um, rural areas have suffered badly from the impact of the actual right to buy over the years and many um many council housing that was built in rural areas was some of the first that has been bought and that has affected the supply of you know affordable homes just another example of the effect of a bad policy um but Basically, I just want some reassurance around paragraph 72 of the NPPF, which, as far as I can see, this site meets mostly. I just wanted some clarification over the um, over the last part of the first sentence after the um, after the last comma, which says that unless the need for such homes is already being met within the authorities area so just some sort of reassurance that there is a need for um for for entry level exception sites and um yeah i mean given the uh, given the desperate supply of you know affordable homes whether you live in an urban or whether you live in a, a uh, in a rural area um exception sites whether they're in a rural or an urban location, are actually badly needed. Yes, sir. thank you. So in response, um, yes, in terms of the city, we are in need of affordable housing. Um, been through multiple appeal decisions, which gives significant weight to affordable housing, um, just because it doesn't come forward at the uh, rate of people requiring it. And also in the um, housing needs survey that we spoke about earlier that found at least um, eight affordable houses were needed in the locality. Um, so there is a need of affordable housing across the entire city area and specifically in Copford as well. I hope that helps. Oh, we have a council launch. Well, okay, thank you. Anybody else any questions? So we have a proposal from Councillor Chapman <coughs> that we accept the um, the application as it is, plus with a couple of provisos of we look into the footpath that can be provided and also the local uh, housing scheme for residents. Shall I just run through the um, additionals that I think I've yes, picked up on? Um, so it would be the additional conditions in the amendment sheet, of which there are four, which relate to contamination. The additional uh, condition relating to pedestrian access through the site um and the ensuring in the section 106 that um in the cascade mechanism it is provided to neighboring rural parishes rather than stanway 
It's great. So can I have a second, please? Councillor Davison. So um, all those in favour of the application and the add-ons, please raise your hands. That's unanimous, Chair. That's unanimous. Thank you very much, uh, everybody. That ends that uh, application. Thank you, Nadine. Um, all those who want to leave now may do so, or you want to stay for the other applications. Thank you. Yeah, get yeah. Jackie back in and she can uh, then we'll start on the next one. Thank you, everybody, for waiting. Welcome back, Jack and McLean. Um, and now we have 7.2, the Hushween Farm, Manbures Railway Cone, a new dwelling. Chris Harden to present, please, Chris. Thank you, Chairman. So this is an application for a new dwelling at Hushwing Farm. And I'll just take you through the site and uh, show you where it is. Uh, so essentially, uh, this just gives you the... Uh, location and environment i hope you can see my uh uh mouse arrow there near hammond's farm up there it just shows the proximity to main road so it's at the uh, top sort of left hand side of the screen uh, adjacent to hammond's farm just located in there this shows the uh the roads leading to the site so uh you'll see it's not far off the uh, beat track really You've got some main roads and then smaller roads leading to the site, as you probably noticed when you were on your site visit. So this is a closer view of the site. So for this application, the dwelling is the hatched area there. And then the equestrian centre is uh, adjacent to it. And then you've got the adjacent farm buildings relating to Hammond's farm, which is in different ownership. Uh, this is a uh, closer view of the site. So the red line area shows where the dwelling would go. You'll see it's uh, orientated facing towards the access into the site with the equestrian centre beyond it and then the menage down here and uh, other buildings parking and manoeuvring in this area here. This is an aerial view. So the dwelling would be located, I'll try and get the mouse still in, this location here. There's the menage there. So you can see the context of the site. You'll note that um, there's quite a decent tree belt along the front of the site with the main road. So it does actually serve as a very useful screen to the site overall. So uh, in visual terms, the, the site is not particularly prominent in the environment, as hopefully you have noticed uh, when you're on your site visit. So this is the dwelling proposed. It's a three bedroom property, approximately 7.5 meters high. You've got gable widths of six meters. So it gives a generally traditional, modestly sized farmhouse scale of property. Got a mixture of fenestration, it's fair to say, but uh, generally I think that uh, it works well for uh, on a property of this style. The initial application came in with five bedrooms. So this one has been reduced to three during the lifetime of this application. I'll just take you through some 
site photograph. So this is the access into the site. You'll see that the access has got good visibility. You also note that the roads are relatively narrow, but um, I noted when I used these roads that there are uh, passing places along them, either sort of informal in the verges or driveways, etc. So all along those roads, there is room for vehicles to pass and negotiate uh, with one vehicle pulling over into the uh, side of uh, the passing place. So looking into the site, shows the tree belt and then the access branches round to the right behind the trees. That's looking across the field at the front of the site. Um, right in the distance, you'll see the uh, hay barn just back there and then Hammond's farm right up there. So this is getting close to the site. So uh, the dwelling will be approximately in this location here. And then you've got the hay barn and then the, re the rest of the equestrian centre up here. And then the menage in there, the boundary tree belt and then Hammond's farm beyond. And then sort of looking back the other way. So the dwelling going approximately in here, hay barn, menage, parking manoeuvring area. And this is looking back from the parking manoeuvring area along the boundary with um, Hammond's Farm, Menage. You'll see the, the mound here with some new planting, which is, is taken but has not uh, grown very tall as yet. Then that's looking over the mound towards the backdrop, um, neighbouring dwellings set back there, other farm buildings. Yeah. And a view towards the parking area. The dwellings located way off to the left here. Uh, and this is the uh, floor plan of the dwelling. As I said, it had been reduced from five bedrooms. So you've got living room, hall, kitchen, and then the required utility room and study, which is what would be expected for a um, business of this uh, scale. You, you would expect some sort of area for office stroke study. Then the bedrooms upstairs and finally this is what it's about basically horses on the site take you back to the site so turning to the planning considerations um, the dwelling is for the owner of the equestrian business and the owner's comments uh, submitted to the application are outlined at the start of the committee report um, along with the planning history, um, which is also listed in great detail. So the principle of the application is acceptable. In terms of policy uh, principles, the site's in the countryside, um, but it's considered that uh, it's been demonstrated there is an essential need to house this um, dwelling on the site to serve the, um, the needs of the business. In accordance with um, national planning policy, Framework paragraph 80 and also the local plan policy DM 14, which is quoted in the committee report. In effect, it's considered the essential need is required because of uh, the security of the premises and also the welfare of the horses and the livery service uh, on the site. There are a number of high value horses on the site, as outlined in the report, um, running into many thousands of pounds. And also in terms of welfare, um, you'll note that. A colic can be a major danger to horses and can be a medical emergency. So you do need someone on site to make sure that uh, help is on hand if the worst comes to the worst, basically. Um, you'll also note in terms of the viability of the business and financial test, it is a long standing business and has moved from just down the road, which uh, has moved into this site in 2020. So the business was at uh, uh, a site just down the road, which was in 2014. So it's been going on for essentially seven or eight years at least. Um, in terms of financial details, those have been submitted and they did demonstrate that the turnover uh, is rising for the business and also the profitability is at a sustainable level. And those accounts have been analyzed carefully and do accord with what we would normally expect for a business like this. Uh, and in terms of viability, justifying the uh, dwelling on financial grounds. 
Um, he also notes in the report that the uh, NPPF also stresses the need and importance of supporting rural businesses uh, in the countryside, um, as does policy DM6 outlined in the committee report. So in terms of the specific details of the application, we consider that the three bedroom dwelling is of a size and scale that's appropriate for the uh, location and commensurate with the needs of the business. Um, it has been reduced in size and is now uh, essentially a modest farmhouse of uh, appropriate height. It is uh, appropriately located facing the access into the site. Um, it is relatively close to the existing complex. I don't think we'd want it any closer to the hay barn because that area is utilised for parking, manoeuvring, tractor storage and uh, also the fencing business uh, needs a bit of area in the site as well. So um, it's got a backdrop of modern farm buildings as well. Um, and it's not particularly prominent in the countryside, as I indicated, because you've got uh, frontage planting and tree belts along the main uh, road leading into the site. Nevertheless, we would want some extra landscaping around the building just to help it blend down into the environment. So that will be conditioned. In terms of highway issues, there is adequate parking on the site and adequate manoeuvring. Uh, you can get at least two spaces associated with the dwelling. The overall access into the site has got good visibility. And then access into the dwelling area has also got uh, adequate visibility in either direction. And you'll note that the highway authority have not objected to this application. And in terms of residential amenity for this uh, the dwelling, uh, it's not considered it's going to overlook any neighbouring properties. It is a long way from the neighbouring dwellings and uh, this dwelling will not result in extra noise um, impacts on the neighbouring property. Parking manoeuvring is well away. There's no overbearing impact. So um, it's acceptable in that respect. We will condition construction times to make sure no noisy construction at uh, social hours. And then finally on other issues, uh, there's no impact upon vegetation, as you can see, and no impact upon wildlife. It's a, it's a flat site without um, any overgrown areas. Um, there will be a requirement for a unilateral undertaking and a RAMS wildlife mitigation payment. So that will uh, need to be uh, completed before any issue um, permission is issued. We don't, don't know the precise figure required for that as yet. Um, the unilateral undertaking is still being worked on. So the recommendation at this stage is for authority to approve with approval being granted subject to the completion of the UU and the uh, RAMS payment. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Chris. Now we move on to the public speakers. So first we have public against speaker, Stephen Barr, please. You have three minutes, Mr. Barr, and the bell will go after two to let you know you've got a minute left. Start when you're ready, please. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman and councillors, um, for allowing me to speak this evening. We're obviously looking at two planning applications, and the first is for a house, um, but we have to be aware that this was an arable field um, up until two years ago, and the scale and pace of development has been um, enormous. So although in the uh, the planning objections comment is not classified as a major development. Um, it is a major development if you live next to it or nearby. Planning consents um, on this site have largely been ignored um, in the last couple of years, and there have been a number of visits um, subsequent to work taking place um, for regularization of breaches of planning. Uh, the menage, as an example, um, is uh, twice the size and in a different place to what planning was given for. There are other things, but at the moment, the hay barn um, that has justified part of the planning and reduction of traffic is actually a stable barn and um, planning officers seem powerless to do anything about that. So whatever planning is given today, I think we need to be clear that um, there is a big scope for creep. The other point is that there are four um, equestrian operations, two of them businesses which immediately border um, land at Hammond's Farm, um, in addition to Hushwing. 
Um, so the council's approval of the application is really a green light for those businesses to put in similar applications to build houses on the land. Um, and I can foresee um, that people are waiting very eagerly for that opportunity to justify under the interpretation of DM 14. Um, riding schools don't really represent a sanctional functional need. Uh, usually that's reserved for breeding. Um, and some of the comments about the value of horses I don't personally agree with, but that's for another time. However, um, a lot of these things have been ignored. Finally, I think this application is really for two permanent dwellings and the council really needs to address the remaining caravans. They're not, not necessary. If accommodation is necessary, then I think planning should be put in for a regular building. We've had to endure those caravans for a very long time. Lastly, my point is about drainage and sanitation. Um, the ditch on my boundary only services Hushwing Farm. The council didn't consider that in previous planning applications and I'm regularly flooded. This will make the situation a lot worse. I know it's referred to, but I hope that any plan for drainage will be at the applicant's expense if this application is improved, approved. Thank you. Thank you. And now we have the public for Lisa Spence, please. Same rules, you have three minutes, the bell go after two. Thanks. Start when you're ready. Good evening. I'm Lisa Spence, a British Horse Society Level 5 coach and competition rider. I'm owner and proprietor of Hemp's Green Equestrian, which began 10 years ago in 2012 at our former site, just 500 yards from Hushwing Farm. It became a limited company in 2014. 2020 saw the move to Hushwing Farm to enable the growth of this much needed and successful educational business. Planning was approved before the purchase of this site. Despite COVID, the new site has been seen the business flourish, and we now employ five full-time staff, including a government-supported apprentice. Our 10 years of accounts show the stability and continual development of the business. The location of the dwelling is sited close enough to the stables to be able to hear if a horse is in distress and to be able to take action quickly in situations like colic or a horse becoming cast, where a horse can get stuck against the wall of their stable and be unable to get themselves up without human intervention. <clears throat> we have sighted it far enough away to offer privacy to our neighbours. The riding establishment's animal activity licence brought in in 2018 has supported the need for on-site living by only awarding five stars to those who reside and offer 24-hour supervision. I am proud to say that we have been awarded the five-star status for the last three inspections. The licensing inspection looks at all aspects of care provided when awarding the five-star status. The livery side of the business and my passion for competing means we have the privilege of training and housing some expensive and successful competition horses who not only have significant value, but the highly strung nature of them makes them more susceptible to injury and problems like colic, making the needs to be on site essential. This means that we also have to employ the services of one of my staff to reside on site when and if we take a holiday. We have reduced the size of the dwelling of which the functional need has already been established. We now feel this is of a suitable size to enable us to benefit from generational living, allowing us to accommodate my elderly parents who currently live in France and look after our nieces and nephews, which we do to support our extended family. The issue raised regarding water pressure was due to a water leak. However, we plan to install rainwater harvesting system for the house and the stable yard. We also have a long-term plan to create a borehole. The parish council raised concerns over water runoff from our site. I can only state that since moving to Hushwing Farm, we have cleaned and maintained the ditch on our boundary and it runs freely. The current foul water drainage has also raised as unsatisfactory. We have addressed this with a replacement treatment plant that will be commissioned to replace the existing old septic tank. I have been advised that the new treatment plant is of sufficient size to cover both the dwelling and the education centre. Thank you for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, thank you, but we don't, we don't have to do that, we'd love to, but 
Could you turn the microphone off before you go, please? Thank you very much. Um, Chris, is there anything you, you want to address in there? The flooding was brought up, um, lack of drainage and that, but um, anything you want to bring up? Um, yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, um, first of all, I'll just go through briefly the comments from Mr. Barr. Um, yes, sir. Uh, I can see why it's deemed that it is a major development in the, uh, the location. It's not technically a major development in planning terms. Horse sites do require a lot of space because you know horses do need to roam around the paddocks. So they do take up a lot of area, but nevertheless, it's the sort of thing that is expected in the countryside. You know, the countryside isn't a museum. Horses have been in the countryside for centuries, basically. Um, they can't go anywhere else. They can't be put in cities. So from that point of view, it is considered an equestrian use of this scale is appropriate for the countryside location. You do obviously, obviously have to look at precise detail of each case to make sure it stacks up in terms of amenity, highway safety, visual impacts, etc. But uh, this sort of scale of development is considered appropriate, um, including in this location. Um, uh, points were raised about enforcing against uh, various things on the site. It's fair to say there have been one or two things that uh, were done uh, that didn't have the benefit of permission, but those have been addressed quite rapidly. They weren't particularly of significant scale. Um, so uh, sometimes, you know, that does happen when, for example, a building is not quite finished in the right cladding or other things that have uh, been done like the menage was bigger than was approved for, but that's now been addressed um, and cleared and approved. And it's a reasonable size menage anyway, so it's not like it's a massive menage. It's a fairly standard sort of size menage, to be honest. Um, I don't think it'll give the green light to other dwellings in the location. Each one will be judged on its merits if other people come in with a requirement for a dwelling. We'll have to get the business in great detail. Certainly in my career, it used to be that uh, you wouldn't get a dwelling on an equestrian site unless you had a folding unit where it was really essential to live 24-7. But times have changed in, in terms of equestrian um, uses. It's becoming increasingly obvious that um, these businesses do need someone to live on site to look after the horses, um, to be there to make sure they are safe. Um, in welfare terms and also in security terms. And the NPPF guidance does indicate that security, particularly for businesses such as this, sort of got very high value um, products on site. You know, it really is an important situation. And we have had a number of other such businesses uh, within the, uh, the district that I've dealt with that we have granted um, groomsmen and things like, uh, you know, people living on site or equestrian uses because of the nature of the, the equestrian businesses. And those haven't been for foaling units. They've been for similar uses such as this. So this is not an uncommon approach nowadays. Um, I think in terms of the two caravans, they, uh, they've been on site for some time. Um, they would be used um, occasionally for for example, someone staying over when the owners are on uh, holiday just to look after the horses. Um, we have put a condition on saying that it would be good to have their uh, appearance improved. So there will be some mitigation details to be submitted. It could either be, for example, cladding them or making them a darker appearance, for example. Um, there's not really room to landscape close to them because you've got an oak tree uh, right next to them and they're not not much room for planting to be honest in front of them but they have got a modern building uh, behind them so it's not like they stick out um, beyond existing sort of curtages but they can be improved um, we have got conditions on about drainage um, some details have been submitted about the foul drainage arrangements they may well be acceptable, but we all need to condition it because they'll need to be checked uh, with our environmental health officer to make sure they are satisfactory. Um, normally the, the modern treatment plants are satisfactory. It's, uh, it's the old septic tanks that prove not to be satisfactory. So we'll need to check those details, but um, I suspect they are going to be acceptable, but 
given concerns raised, we do need to look at that closely, you know, including details of surface water drainage. So that will be controlled by condition. Um, I think that's probably covered the issues, but if there's anything else, then uh, please let me know. Well, thank you, Chris. Welcome up to the committee. Any questions from members? Councillor Davison going just first. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, yeah, thank you, Mr. Harden, for the uh, comprehensive report. Um, we have went on the site visit, and obviously there's a 32-acre site uh, fully used for equine use currently. And I do understand that uh, under policy DM14, uh, obviously rural housing is allowed. And I'm pleased to see it's conditioned in uh, your third uh, condition, that it's, it should be uh, remain as an agricultural building, effectively, agricultural workers house. My only problem is that it says in your condition three, equine use only, uh, and actually it ought to be more wider than that because DM14 does actually say that it should be for um, any rural based business uh, or worker that was uh, currently employed. So I'd quite like to tweak tweak that if you could. Um, the other the other thing I want to reassure really is that obviously it's a 32 acre site. Uh, it's been through all the viability, the economic viability process. So we know that you know it should be sustainable. Um, but in future, if for example it went into uh, intensive uh, horticulture or something like that, it may be split up into five acre plots or ten acre plots. So um i think uh you know we, it all we can do is judge this one on its own merits but it doesn't mean to say that it wouldn't uh wouldn't change in future um the other thing i was just querying really was the construction hours which are standard but actually it's so far away from anywhere else i wonder whether actually that could be more flexible but um if they're happy to accept that then there's no problem thank you Councillor Pearson. Thank you, Chair. I was pleased to hear what Mr. Harden was saying about the uh, mobile homes that are on site and the need to uh, just improve the way in which those look. Just look at MPPF um, paragraph 80. Um, it's quite clear that there's an essential need for a rural worker, and that's and we we have to ensure that one or more of the circumstances that are outlined there apply. Um, I do think, though, it would be nice if we could have also as a uh, an additional um, pa paragraph or subsection E suggests that the design is of exceptional quality and that it is truly outstanding, reflecting the highest standards in architecture and would help raise standards of design more generally in rural areas. Chris, would you like to address those comments, please? Uh, yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, I think in terms of conditioning, it be allowed for an agricultural worker as well as the equine. I, I wouldn't mind a comment from Simon Cairns on that, to be honest, just to see what his view is. Because obviously we specifically linked it to this business. Um, if we said an agricultural worker could come into this, then that wouldn't relate to this business. Um, it could relate to any agricultural use and you'd need to demonstrate an essential need. But uh, I would welcome Simon's comments to see what he thinks uh, about that. Thank you, Chair. Yes, um, it's not unusual to include um, agricultural workers as uh, Councillor Davidson suggested, and I'm sure we could uh, widen the uh, condition three to capture um, the category of rural worker as well um, it would open up the uh the dwelling should it no longer be required for equestrian purposes to be for other rural workers um, in the general locality so it certainly makes sense thank you chair thank you simon uh yes and on the other points um uh let's see Construction hours, 
was recommended by environmental protection. The applicant is happy to have those hours. Um, I think it's probably worth keeping on, to be honest, because you can get sort of saws, you know, electric saws and things, as the noise can travel, particularly in a rural area. So I'd recommend we keep that condition on, to be honest. And, you know, lorries delivering stuff can be quite noisy if they turn up at like nine o'clock at night, dropping pallets and stuff. Again, that can be noisy in a rural area. So I'd say we should keep that on. Um, and then Councillor Pearson's comment about exceptional quality. Um, I think there is already the justification for a rural worker. So you would not necessarily have to then demonstrate that this is an exceptional uh, quality of design. Um, I think it's a modest sort of farmhouse type of property really. And we had something that really sort of went into a big modern exceptional design or a very traditional exceptional design. I, I don't know, it might be a bit excessive on this site. So I think to keep something fairly quiet and modest in my view is probably the best approach in this case. Um, so I wouldn't push for changing the design, to be honest. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Chris. Councillor McLean. Thank you, Chair. Um, could you tell me how many staff are actually present on this time uh, during the working day? And due to the fact that these are all thoroughbred horses and highly strung, would they are the caravans used as welfare units for the staff? Because obviously, if something happens, there's going to be um, a few people needed on site just to calm things down or to help with the animals. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, the number of staff does vary, but it, it seems to range from five to seven and a half, basically. Um, a total of five overall full-time employment and other cleaners and, and things like that. Um, the, the caravans at the moment essentially are mainly for the, the owner who's living in them. In future, they, they, there is obviously the proposed um, welfare building in the other application, which um, is the next application. Uh, the caravans would be used for ten, potentially for um, for example, staff staying over to cover the holiday periods, etc. Um, I don't think they'd pre predominantly be used for welfare because that's uh, the new building being proposed under the next application, basically. Um, yeah, I think that covers So actually. would they be removed, the caravans, or will they be retained if they're such an eyesore? Well, they're down to be retained. Um, I think that's uh, that's outlined in the report and the presentation. They're down to be retained. The next application, um, you'll see that they would be for temporary accommodation overnight for staff to look after um, the site if you know the, the applicant holiday, etc. Um, so they're down to be retained with the condition saying that they shall be improved in appearance for a dark finish or you know cladding, something like that. It's a bit confusing, really, because you've got two applications. It's a shame they didn't come together. We could have gone through it all and worked it out. Because I feel if they've got, if the next application is coming forward, I don't see there's a need to keep the caravans as they're an eyesore and they're untidy and not very pleasant. So I think we need to be mindful of that because that will just exacerbate the problem, and maybe lead on to something else. Simon wants to come in. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, um, in response to Councillor McLean's point, that is a matter you can consider under the next item, Chair. So if you wish to see those removed or conditioned in some way, we can, of course, achieve that under the next item. Councillor Tate. Uh, my point was the same about the caravan, so we'll come back to that. OK, thank you. Hey, well, Councillor Wall. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I just want to come back on um, the question my colleague, Councillor Pearson, asked and Chris's, Chris's response. I mean, generally, building within, uh, within, within, the, uh, the, um, within rural areas, um, the Essex Design Guide is actually 
pointing out that they should be truly outstanding as opposed to previously outstanding um and and innovative however am i right in thinking that what's been given precedence here within uh within paragraph 80 is that it is it is it's subsection a that is being met and that and that is one or more of of the following circumstances so that's overriding b e, which is talking about it being of outstanding and picking up on councillor mclean's point are there any precedents being set here by not trying to accommodate e at the same time uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, the the categories are not um, do not have to be conflated, so they are one or the other. So in this instance, this is a um, a, a rural workers house, which by its very nature is rarely outstanding architecturally. The category of out, uh, truly outstanding houses are for um, what you to refer to as the sort of mansion in the countryside category, um, for truly outstanding and exceptional pieces of of uh, um, trophy architecture, um, which would be allowed purely as pieces of trophy architecture on their merit, not requiring any other justification to be there in the countryside. So the current proposal is purely an agricultural workers dwelling uh, unrelated to its aesthetic merits. Um, hopefully that clarifies matters, Chair. Councillor Warns, you got follow back to that? Um, no, Chair, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? So, so I've reached the point now where we it is up for approval. Have we got a proposal for this? And the second, do we have a reminder of conditions attached, please, Chris, before we go to the, the vote so that we know what we're voting for? You want to go through the conditions, Chairman? Is that right? Yeah, were there any additional ones? Of what we're, um, well, we're, we're, we're changing the um, condition three to widen it so that it's not just the equestrian occupation but that is uh, an agricultural worker as well okay. basically so that's, I think that's the only change that's we've, the only change yeah, yeah we've got the uh, sewage treatment details on that so yeah that's the only change thank you very much so uh, proposal by uh, Councillor Pearson have we got a seconder Okay. So McCarthy, so all those in favour with the conditions attached as such, please raise your hands. Thank you, members. That application has passed. Oh, sorry, nine. Okay, for those against, all those abstaining. One abstention. Thank you very much. Uh, the application is approved. And now we move on to the next application, which is 7.3. Um, Chris Harden to report again, please. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, so this application relates to the same site. Um, and uh, it's for an education centre and welfare facility and the two uh, client and student accommodation pods. A reminder of the site. And essentially, the welfare centre is going here, this red plan here. And then the student pods down here, these two tiny little red dots on the plan there. Uh, the Mobile homes are located here, and the aim uh, would be to retain those for overnight accommodation for occasional staff for a special events to, uh, to be on hand and additional care when the applicant goes on holiday, for example. Um, just take this as a slightly closer up view, showing the buildings uh, in a bit more detail in terms of their footprint. And this shows the building to be used as a welfare facility. See the, um, the area inside has, has got room for three or four tables. 
that obviously limits the number of um, students you can get in there. And then the uh, student pods are these small buildings here. Again, small scale. Just a reminder of the site and the, the proximity of the uh, buildings. And that's an, an example of a similar sort of student pod close to the boundary. Right, so in terms of planning considerations, you'll see that a lot of extra information has been submitted by the applicant to support the scheme, um, explaining why the business um, would like this extra uh, accommodation for students. Um, you'll note that we did make reference to the comments from the highway authorities who initially raised concerns about the intensity of use of the site. So uh, the applicant provided further information about exactly what was going on at the site and that essentially the majority of it was transferred from the previous site. Um, so it concluded that there wasn't, uh, the Harbour Authority concluded there was not now an objection following the submission of the further information. Um, it's not considered there would be an intensification of use of the site that would warrant causing a severe impact on the road network, as referred to in uh, paragraph 111 of the NPPF. So we're happy in that respect. The access into the site is good. And the visibility displays that uh, the entrance to the main road are good in either direction, as you probably hopefully noted when you went out on site. And then there is adequate parking maneuvering within the site to accommodate the actual proposed use of the site overall. Um, so turning to the design and scale of the buildings, and the location of them, the education centre and welfare facility building is located well within the site, um, next to a uh, bond which has got planting on and also is going to be screened already by the existing hay barn and also from other views by the stable barn. So it's, it's well contained within the site, it's low lying and it's considered to be of an appropriate design. Um, similarly, the student pods are close to the boundary, very small scale. And um, it's not considered those would represent uh, an impact uh, that would detract from the character of the surrounding countryside. In terms of impact on neighboring residential amenity, it's not considered the intensity of use would cause significant extra noise. Um, the neighboring property dwelling is some way away from this site being the other side of existing farm buildings. Uh, Environmental protection have raised no concerns in that respect. It's not considered there would be any overlooking of the neighbouring property to any significant degree. If there is a statutory nuisance caused by, um, for example, students making a noise, then environmental protection can investigate that under separate legislation. So in terms of other issues, with regard to the caravans, um, it is considered that providing they are either screened by some extra cladding or given a darker finish that they could um, appear acceptable in the countryside. They do have the backdrop of an existing relatively modern stable barn. They are partly hidden by an oak tree, so they're not particularly prominent in the countryside. Um, they're not ideal, but I don't think... Uh, you know, we can insist on them being removed, but uh, would welcome comments from councillors in that respect. Um, they would not be used for permanent residential accommodation because that would now be in the new dwelling provided on site. Um, other issues, there's not an impact on vegetation or wildlife. We will be conditioning foul and surface water drainage um, given neighbouring concerns. So the recommendation is for approval with the conditions as outlined in the report. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Chris. And then we have public speakers. Stephen Barr, please.
same rule will apply, Stephen. So when you're ready. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, Pitt, will you allow me just to ask for a clarification on one of the conditions of the last application? Um, when there's a reference to sewage treatment, it's also um, surface water runoff. And maybe that's just a pedantic point, but I think that needs to be in the conditions. And I think it was actually in the report. I think if you if you just do your speech, include that, we'll ask the planning officer to, to, okay. uh, to remark on it when you've done, okay? Do you want to okay, speak? right. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, the staff were well building really is a house or a dwelling house by any other name and signals intent for further expansion of Hems, of Hems Green equestrian business. Um, it's not really necessary with staff living locally. And there's also this issue that needs to be cleared up about the caravans. It's a massive expansion. And I'm glad that we're now talking about both applications together. If it is the council's intention to approve this application, conditions should be applied to prevent this from being turned into um, some form of house in the future. Um, the glamping pods are a big concern for me. I've been complaining to the council since last October and I've had no support um, for the excessive noise and I've sent videos in of the level of noise we already have to deal with. So the thought of glamping pods right on my boundary, which are actually closer to my house than the intended dwelling that's been approved under the last application, um, to me is, is frankly um, very, very unfair. So there's been no consideration to noise or working hours um, at Hushwing Farm. Um, so my, my points really are that um, the caravans should, should really go. They were only ever approved as a temporary thing years ago. And I think people tend to forget the discussions that were held in previous planning um, discussions and why approval was given. Um, we talk about no impact on um, the surrounding neighborhood in a, in a rural location, but actually, if you're living there, um, there's a huge impact. And as I say, and the pictures that are provided to the council, um, my house actually is very close. Um, and we already inside the building and in our garden hear the noise. And that noise can only increase um, with the planned expansion. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now in support of the application, Lisa Spence. Same three minutes, the bell after two, Lisa. Thank you. Um, the Education Centre, uh, which is the building that we're proposed, with both of our equestrian centre, it has become clear that the current facilities for lectures for clients and staff welfare are insufficient with the existing um, mobile homes. We have, um, we hope that the new education centre will provide these amenities. <clears throat> Concerns have been raised regarding the competitions and clinics that we run for fear of increased traffic. These are fundamentally for the benefit of our internal clients. They are occasionally supported by clients of local livery yards, especially those who don't have access to their own equine transport. The revenue of these activities brought in an additional £17,500 of profit for our business last year. The competitions support the demand and give opportunity to those whose finances and circumstances don't allow them to otherwise compete. It offers experience to those training towards their professional qualifications. Many of our clients make use of our free train collection from Marks Tay and Chapel Station, as well as collections from the bus stop at Vernon's Road, which we offer in a bid to make us accessible to a wider audience. As with any business, some noise will be generated, especially as coaches give commands vocally. We use headsets for our private tuition, but they are not successful in windy conditions, as the noise of the wind into the microphone overrides the noise of the instruction. We are awaiting to trial a new system, not designed for horse riders, but for triathletes and designed to work with swimming. We are hoping that these will be more successful. The retention of the mobile homes, we hope will be seen as a temporary situation. 
Brighton, as the new education centre will provide the business office, reception area, staff room, larger lecture room and welfare facilities. And with its location close to the car park, it also provides the required disabled access and it will enable one of the mobile homes to no longer be required. Being one of only six level four British Horse Society assessment centres in the UK, we provide an essential service to our industry. Our glamping pods will help support the business by offering on-site accommodation to these clients, reducing vehicle trips from town centre accommodation, as well as providing an additional source of income. The glamping pods will allow some occasional staff accommodation when we have early starts, sick horses, or heavens forbid I take a holiday. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Chris, would you like to address some of the comments made? First of all, Mr. Barr, please. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, uh, in terms of the surface water drainage point made, uh, yes, on the dwelling, it was just the treatment plant that was applied. Um, in this application, we've got foul and surface water. I think it's because the the dwelling is a long way from the boundary. Um, we could add in, I suppose, on the other on the dwelling application, surface water as well, if really required. But we've obviously determined that application now. Um, but it's certainly the surface water drainage is added on the second application because it is closer to the boundary um, and was deemed more essential to have it in that application so it's covered in the second second application um in terms of the other points made uh i think the the glamping uh in in effect the student accommodation has been justified in terms of it does reduce vehicular movements they are very small um, pods, they're behind a, a mound or close to a, a boundary. The neighbouring dwelling is not adjacent to these pods. There are buildings in between, and those buildings at Hammonds Farm appear to be used for some form of commercial purposes as well. So there is already some noise emanating from Hammonds Farm. We saw a number of vans at that property when we visited the site. So it's not like it's a silent site. There is activity there already. Um, if there is excessive noise, then as I said on the other application, environmental protection can take a look at that under the statutory nuisance legislation. I've got no reason to believe that the pods would result in excessive noise, but there is uh, a way of looking at that if there is a statutory nuisance. Um, the original permission on this site was granted on appeal and the inspector did not put on hours of uh, use of the site in any of his conditions. I think it's worth noting that the use of the site is limited by daylight, particularly in the winter. There are not floodlights there as such. So um, in effect, uh, the hours of use of the site will be reduced in winter and darker times and obviously a bit later in the summer. Um, in terms of the mobile homes, the applicant made a point about a temporary situation. Um, there could potentially be a condition saying that they could re be removed and that they'll just be temporary while um, the new dwelling is being built and while the rest of the site is up and running. I have the authority from the applicant to do that. So there is some flexibility in relation to the mobile homes. I think that covers the issues. Chairman, if there's anything else, just let me know. Councillor McLean. Thank you, Chair. Um, I still stand by requesting the caravans are removed. In fact, I didn't know they were actually mobile homes. That's a whole new level. It's not a caravan in my book. That's almost like another dwelling. I think if they've got the welfare centre, they've got the accommodation. I think, you know, how many people are on this site, you know, who are going to need accommodation? 
you've got glamping pods well that's a whole new level that could be used for anything it doesn't have to be people on horseback it could be used all year round so that's a holiday letting business so I think you've got a few scenarios here and I think we need to safeguard the neighbours or neighbour it depends because once we approve this he will have no comeback to actually safeguard anything of his so you, and it's going to cause major complications down the line and I think we need to be mindful for both of them so we come to an amicable decision that there will not be any nonsense in the future because it's unfair to pass something that could cause major problems with the sewage the runoff and you can never get to the bottom of that later on in life and I think it's very sad to put that on any resident we're here to discuss this and to give the fairest outcome we can for the residents even for the developer but you know they've had the caravans they've done their job and once this unit's new, newly built they I think they need to go because we're not actually portraying a very smart site either I don't think you know so you want it to be the best of what you can do without having you know a couple of caravans or a couple of mobile homes then they'll get a few more going around the perimeter they'll just come on site I think we need to safeguard it and I hope everybody will support me in that, please. Okay, thank you. Councillor Chow. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, my question is regards to the climbing uh, the pots. Can you or have an idea of how many people can it accommodate overnight, please? There's actually a question for, for the plan officer. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, first of all, with regard to the comments from Councillor McLean, um, if we wanted to uh, request the mobile homes be removed on this application, then I have the authority from the applicant to do that. I think it would obviously need to be a reasonable time scale. They do expire in June 2023, um, and the aim would be for the applicant to move out of them and then move into their new residence. But there is the authority from the applicant if it's a sticking point on the application to say, OK, we can remove the mobile homes. Stroke caravans, they're, they're sort of they're sort of a mixture, really. They're not massive structures. Um, in terms of sewage runoff mentioned, that is carefully conditioned in the committee report. In terms of the pods, you'll note that there is a condition six in this application where it says the proposed temporary accommodation stroke student pods not be occupied other than for employment or on-site educational purposes relating to the existing equestrian use. It should not be used as a main sole or main residence or holidays or short stays. So they're not glamping, they are, uh, directly to be used relating to the equestrian use and that's that's outlined in condition six so there's a tight condition in that respect um they are the student pods with good condition to be the same size as shown in the drawings and the same footprint so they're tightly controlled in terms of their scale it looks like you could fit two people in each one quite tight fit but two people i would say so that, that's the uh, extent of, of the accommodation. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Pearson. Thank you, Chair. I was quite pleased to hear from the applicant that uh, the intention is that a number of the individuals who will be learning on site will also be transported to and from public transport. So that, that for me, uh, it's pleasing to hear that there's a reduction in private transportation to and from this site when this uh, facility is is up and running. Um, I think coming back to Councillor McLean's point, I, I just refer to Mount Bure's Parish Council's comments in, in their one, two, three, fourth paragraph say, Parish Council would like to suggest that any permanent staff accommodation could be included within the development of the new dwelling the parish council is concerned about the retention of the caravans, which are generally an eyesore. So I think 
given what we've heard, um, is uh, a, an intention or a, a willingness on the part of the applicant, I think we ought to be saying as a condition that uh, as soon as the permanent building is completed, these two caravans should be removed. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'm, I'm conflicted on this particular issue because the applicant has clearly said that there's a need to keep at least one of the mobile homes uh, for actual workers' use and to be able to cover um, when, obviously, the occupants of the house, which I assume is going to be the actual majority holder in the business, is not going to be around. And my understanding of the National Planning Policy Framework is that it does make provision for making effective use of land. Um, and that does include other uses as well as homes, while safeguarding and improving the environment. So I do get the points that colleagues are making about the environment, but the applicant has clearly said there's still a use and need for at least some of those caravans and it looks to me like planning policy actually supports that so i'm actually conflicted and i would i would appreciate a bit more in-depth advice about about the need and use of the actual caravans before i can come to a decision chair uh, sorry chair. No, no, chair. chris thank you chairman Yes, um, I did specifically discuss this with the applicant um, before the committee, basically, um, you know, over the last couple of weeks or so, this particular point. Um, and I think the view is that if there is a, a, a requirement for the carons to be removed to enable the application to succeed, then um, they would be willing to accept that. Um, I think you can also bear in mind that the pods could potentially be used for a staff overnight if uh, the applicant is on holiday, for example. So I don't think it'd be the end of the world. Um, so I think it, you know, if there is a real push to have the mobile home and caravan removed, I don't think that's going to be a significant issue for the applicant um, because it has been discussed with the applicant and the, this scenario was looked at. And um, if there is a desire for them to go, don't think it's going to cause a massive problem for the applicant. I'll take Simon then, because the council today is right. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, suggest um, on that basis that if members are so minded, that we condition removal of the mobile homes prior to the first occupation of either the education centre or the dwelling house. And I would also add that if you look at the education centre, there are, um, bathroom facilities within that building and should a staff member be required to stay overnight um, I would have thought that temporary accommodation within that uh, education centre would equally be possible so I can personally see no reason why those um, mobile homes could not be removed um, as a number of members have indicated. Yeah I was going to talk about the caravans but uh, I think that uh covered that um, my view is as well that they should be removed for the reasons stated and the um, uh, opportunity for staff to stay in the pods. Um, my other query though, I just want to establish as there seems to be a bit of um, um, two different opinions on the fact that the glamp, not glamping, the pods are closer to the neighbour than they are to the new property that's going to be built. Um, I just wanted some clarity on that, because if that is the case, that doesn't seem particularly fair. I know if I was a student and went to stay in a pod afterwards, I'd probably have a couple of drinks, go up to the local pub. Um, and I feel if I was to be noisy, which I might, uh, it isn't particularly fair, it affects the neighbour. I think that um, on, our, on our visit yesterday, we saw the side of the glamper moment, and we saw the side next door there was a lot of activity people working and the house for next door is is the other side of the industrial buildings there so it's not that close what we'd be quite happy with the site as it is so, but is it closer to the new house that's going up 
or closer to the neighbour? Because that's the issue. We'll pass that one over. <laughs> Member, should we should we put a, a, um, a plan on the screen to, to clarify this point for you? I think it would probably be easier, wouldn't it? Thank you. I'm sorry, members, we'll be with you shortly. See that, Chairman. So the neighbouring dwelling is located there. Just to help everyone see, you can see the slide. You can also see. So down on the bottom, right hand side. There. Ah, superb. So, yes, the neighboring dwelling is there. And there are obviously some buildings in the way, then hard surfacing, then uh, some boundary. You've got the bunding sort of down here and then some planting here. And then the dwelling proposed for the applicants is sort of around this area here. So. So it's probably slightly closer to the neighbor's dwelling than the applicant's dwelling but then you've got more buildings in the way between the neighbor's dwelling and the uh, and the site so you know it's a judgment really they're pretty big but i'll just show you a this probably there's a yeah, so that sort of shows the scales of the buildings in between. So there's the neighbour's dwelling there. These are the buildings in between. And then further down to the right, beyond the bunding, um, would be the uh, two pods, basically. Uh, if members were so minded, we could condition a detailed scheme for the reciting of the pods to be submitted and agreed. Uh, by condition, if you have concerns over the detailed citing of those pods. It sounds good. Um, so we're probably reaching the point now where Councillor Davison. Sorry, Chairman, thank you. Um, just if we're going to regularise everything, uh, I noticed on 4.5, uh, there was a mention about her husband's fencing business. Uh, is that included? Has that got currently got permission or not? Because it certainly on the site visit, we saw quite an extensive amount of fencing installed there. It does say it's been there for over 20 years. So, so he's had the business for 20 years. Whether or not it's been there for 20 years, I wouldn't have thought so. No. Forgive me, Chris, the, permission, the permission on the site, does it include a fencing business? That's not part of this application, Chairman. Um, I don't recall that being granted any permission on this site. Um, it wasn't discernible the first time I went there, I think. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's not part of this application. Yeah, so that, that's an entirely different separate issue, which is here to discuss this application about the houses. So. Um, if there is an issue, then I'm sure somebody could uh, plan and enforcement could look into it. But um, so we're we're reaching the end of the, the application, and I think members would be quite happy that um, 
if we are to proceed with the approval, we would like to see the mobile homes removed when the the house and accommodation is up and running. Are we happy with that? Yes. Can I have a proposal for that, please? Councillor Pearson and second by Councillor Tate. So with that, um, Simon's going to interrupt. S sorry, Chair. Can I just clarify, are you wanting a further condition with regard to the reciting of the glamping pods, or right. are you happy with them as they are now? I was just holding my hand up and saying, I don't know whether that's necessary. Proposer's choice. So, no, then, Chair, I'm not proposing that as a further condition. Okay, so we have a proposal. We have a proposal, Councillor Pearson, seconded by Cat. Oh, you changed your mind. Seconded by Councillor McCarthy, uh, and the condition is that the caravans, mobile homes, whatever they are will be removed once a delivery accommodation is occupied. Prior to first occupation, Chair. First occupation. Are we happy with that? Yeah. Can we have a vote, please, for that approval? Thank you very much. That, uh, that goes through with those conditions attached. Yeah. We will now have a comfort break for five minutes. Thank you.
So good evening, everyone. Welcome back. Have a quick break. Our next application is 7.4, land adjacent to three Highfield Drive, Colchester, and Nadine Calder to present, please. Thank you, Chair. I'll try and share my screen, hopefully it's a turn lucky. No. Oh. Oh, yes. There we go. Right, so the last application of tonight is for the construction of a single detached dwelling. The application site is outlined in red here. The site is number three Highfield Road, which is outlined Highfield Drive, sorry, which is outlined in blue, and the application site is a grass area to the north of the site, outlined in red. For cl clarification purposes, this is an extract from our adopter policies maps. Um, the larger area is the entire city of Colchester, and the smaller area, I'm um, sorry, it's very blurred, it's because it's that zoom in. The blue star shows the site. It shows that the site is um, unallocated, not allocated for any purposes. So despite the committee report showing it outlined in green on your first page, page 79 of your committee report pack, um, it is on an area called white land, which means it has no purposes. This is the proposed dwelling. Um, so the proposal includes, there's already a fence along this line, the proposal includes the construction of a dwelling here, fronting the drive to the north. It also includes a feature wall along the northern boundary here. There's an existing garage serving number three, which is proposed to be subdivided. So there will be one space internally each for number three and the new dwelling, and one space outside each, thus providing two spaces for the two dwellings. These are the elevations and the proposed floor plans of the dwelling. It's a three bedroom dwelling. Um, the, it's of a pleasant design with good sized rooms. Um, this, this aspect of the proposal is unobjectionable. We've got the street scene here. Um, look, the top one looking at the dwelling from the north. So towards the end of the drive and the bottom one is looking at it from the access drive and it's looking east, eastwards. You can see and those members visiting the sites on Tuesday would have seen that the levels slope down quite significantly. So um, at the moment it is proposed on slightly lower ground, but there is obviously a quite a significant drop towards the drive towards the north. For those members who haven't been able to go to on site, these um, are the awesome site photos. So this is the access of Lexton Road. The drive is, an, is a private road and an adopted drive. The photo on the left is looking at number three. So this is the host property. And then this open land, open area of land here is where the proposal is going to be. And that's this area here. I would say, there is um, a dispute between the applicant and the and officers of the council. Officers of the council do not believe that this area of land is within the residential curtilage of the dwelling, and therefore um, this fence should not be there, in our opinion. So um, it is there, it doesn't benefit from planning permission, and we don't believe it benefits from um, community development rights. That's the a view again off the side to, um, from the north, looking at number three with the new dwelling being proposed in front of it. And then here we can see the garage, which as I said, will be um, subdivided. And then the bottom photo showing a view from the rear towards the proposed site. This is again a site plan, just showing you again what is proposed in a little bit more color. And now, um, Having read the report, I think you would have noticed that there have been several attempts a dwelling to be constructed on that site. So I'm going to take you through some of the most some of the recent um, applications, all of which have been refused by the council and some of which have been dismissed at appeal. So the most recent one was um, done in 2021. That was a proposal for a detached two-story four-bed dwelling 
we in this um, outline. So all of the proposals have always included a dwelling to the north on this um, land with, I believe this would have been a fence. And again, the um, garage would have been subdivided and provide a parking space. These were the elevations of the dwelling. So the difference of the, the size of the dwelling was very similar. The main difference was internally it was a four bed house and the house would have fronted the eastern um, part of um, Highfield Drive, whereas the current proposal is to have the door in what would have been the side elevation here fronting the northern part of the drive. This was refused in 2021, but it was not appealed. In 2014, there were two applications. This one was for a bungalow. As you can see, it was a little bit further set back than what is currently proposed. The bungalow faces north, as does the current application. We've got an, a boundary enclosure here, and again, the parking for the two dwellings here. Um, some vegetation in front of the boundary. This one was um, refused by the council and it was dismissed on appeal by the planning inspectorate. It was a chalet bungalow or a bungalow. Um, that was the main difference to the current proposal. And also in 2014 was another application um, for a two-story house again, same location. In actual fact, this application, I believe was identical to the one that was reduced in 2017. Um, and this one, as you can see, I, I, I think the only difference to the 2017 application was a small detailed canopy here. Otherwise it was the same. Um, this application and the previous bungalow were dismissed in a joint appeal by the inspectorate. And just to put it in perspective, these, this is a comparison of the four layouts that we've had of the three um, refused applications and the current one. So we've got, we, in all of them, we have a house to the north of number three. The difference is this one is a bungalow. Um, these two face north, these two face west. And then a comparison of the scale. We have a two-story house, again, facing north. The 2021 application was a two-story house facing west. One of the 2014 applications was a bungalow facing north, and the other one was a two-story dwelling facing west. So the main reasons for refusing the application and dismissing them at appeal was that the inspector and officers considered the area of land, which is currently laid to grass, um, to make a valuable and positive contribution towards the otherwise relatively built up area. Um, there has been no change in local or national policy since the appeal decisions or the latest refusal. Um, and therefore, um, officer of the opinion that, um, they, that um, this application doesn't warrant a different recommendation. It doesn't introduce any changes that have not previously been tested at appeal. Um, it's a two-story house facing north. The only difference is the feature wall, which is a nice feature, but it doesn't overcome the fundamental issue of building a house on this plot of land, which is considered to make a positive contribution towards the area. Um, and so the recommendation is one for refusal. I would like to mention one more thing. The report did mention that a unilateral undertaking um, is currently being signed to secure developer contribution towards open space recreation and community facilities to offset the impact of the proposed development. This has not been signed yet. So if members were to resolve to refuse this application today, I would ask that this is made a second reason for refusal. If you were minded to approve it, we could delegate powers to officers and we could issue a decision once the um, UU has been signed and completed. Thank you. Thank you, Nadine. Now we move to the speakers. So we have public against Richard Flower, please. You have three minutes, Mr. Flower. The bill will go after two, and we'll start when you're ready to go. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you for letting me speak this evening. Um, over 12 years, the applicants' various plans for a new dwelling have all been rejected, including by the Secretary of State, who, along with the Council, recognised the importance of this unique open, airy lane. Highfield Drive is a secluded wooded lane with a row of three houses sharing a common building line. The corner site, the subject of the application for a two-storey house, 
is an important open green garden feature which enhances the character of the drive and area. The setback of the existing dwelling and verdant appearance of the site contributes significantly to the character of the area. The proposed development would lead to the loss of this green corner and would cause serious detriments to the street scene and surroundings. The northern wall of the substantial dwelling would be much closer to the drive than the existing dwelling and the others in the lane and would result in a cramped form of development that would harm the character, quality and appearance of the area. The proposal would also result in a rear garden of very limited size compared to the more generous plots of the other properties in the lane, thus changing the character of Highfield Drive and reducing the very quality which makes this an attractive living environment. It would be discordant with its context and fails to enhance the attractive and tranquil character of the area. Um, I've got a number of points on like the DM 19, 17 and 15, well, I'll skip over those in the interest of time. Um, Highfield Drive is a private road that's already receiving more traffic than planned for, and the new development creates no additional parking. The council has previously refused vehicle access over the lane to 9 Sussex Drive, which runs parallel to, to Highfield Drive. Um, Sussex Road, sorry, to protect this lane from the dangers of further traffic. In, in the application, the applicant contends that the site is unused and derelict. It was a pleasant garden until the applicant fenced it off, removed all amenities and allowed it to deteriorate. There are better ways to remedy the situation than by building a house. It would set a dangerous precedent to incentivize applicants to purposely cause an area to reach this state to support a planning application. There are many soothing words in the proposal stating that it will respond positively to local character and context to preserve and enhance the quality of existing places and their environment. However, please note that the applicant is currently refusing, and not for the first time, to contribute to the costs of the upkeep of the road, which all other residents pay their fair share of. This illustrates that the applicant is purely in this for financial gain and not to maintain the pleasant aspect of the site at all. Um, I respect that you, I respectfully, respectfully you request that you refuse permission for this development once again. To quote a previous refusal, I consider the principle of erecting any new dwelling, regardless of its size or design on the appeal site would be likely to harm the character, quality and appearance of the area. Thank you. Thank you. Can I call Michael Smith now, please, the agent? So you have three minutes, the bell go after two. Thank you, Chair. And on behalf of the applicant, thank you for the opportunity to address the committee this evening. With the adoption of Section 2 of the new local plan last summer, there is an opportunity to reassess the site against the Council's new policies. New policies also change the context against which the previous reasons for refusal are viewed. And of course, each decision also provides a clear set of matters that an application for planning permission must address. Understanding why the earlier schemes were not acceptable was the key to preparing a new proposal for the site, and care has been taken to ensure that any impact on the character of the street and the neighbouring properties has been addressed. Policy DM15 sets a new requirement for all development to be designed to a high standard, respond positively to its context, and to achieve good standards of amenity, and the proposal is compliant with the new planning policy. The new standards listed in Policy DM12 take the same approach. And it is easy to, it's easy to dismiss any scheme for a detached house on the corner as being the same as the others that came before it. But this is a wholly new scheme that makes sure that negative impacts are not created. The house has been designed to turn the corner in the street, replicating the narrow front presented by numbers one to three Highfield Drive and presenting a broad frontage to numbers four and five. The street scene shows the house drops down below the level of numbers one to three as a transition where the road slopes to the north so that it neither presents the blank side seen on some of the refuse schemes nor stands at a higher level than the part of the street where a front-to-front -front relationship will be created. The house and the brick wall that wraps around the rear garden are set back from the drive so that there is space for landscaping to soften the corner, maintaining the character created by the trees to the east and the generous front gardens to the north. Positioning the house in the corner also means that there will not be any overlooking, overshadowing or loss of light. The visual impact of the parked cars is addressed by tucking them away on the, on the existing drive, hidden from the street scene. The garage means that the garden is smaller than those of the neighbouring properties, but it is still larger than the minimum set by planning policy and a good trade-off against uncontrolled car parking. 
The new house also stands against the mostly blank side elevation of number three, so the active frontage is created where it is currently missing. These elements fit together to create a scheme that enhances the character of the street and addresses the areas where failings were found in the previous proposals. Of course, I must also add that the proposed home is in a highly sustainable location, well within walking distance of the city centre, an easy bike ride through quiet residential streets to the services and facilities on the east side of Colchester and served by the multitude of bus routes that run along Lexton Road. The site is outside Lexton's conservation area and there are no objections from any statutory consultees, including Essex Highways team, and conditions are recommended to pick up detailed issues such as electric vehicle charging and archaeological investigation. To conclude, the new planning policies require a positive response to local character and context, which is what the proposed scheme delivers. They also seek architectural quality and enhancement of the public realm, which was missing before, but is now proposed. Existing amenity is protected and negative impacts are designed out, leading to a high quality design, which is, for the first time, in accordance with the standards set by the local plan. This is a scheme which should be approved. Therefore, I ask that you reconsider the case officer's recommendation and resolve to grant planning permission. Thank you very much. And then we have a, um, a statement from Councillor Lynn Barton, read by Councillor. Oh, sorry, read by Robert. I thought you were going to do that. Chair, before we do that, do you, Councillor? Oh, I think we. I like to. I like to leave uh, Councillor Winston last because he's. We'll have Councillor Barton's one now, and then we'll call Councillor Winnett's. Right. I'll just check that. So, dear all. The applicant is a resident of Shrub End Ward, and I am speaking in my capacity as her ward councillor. This application has a chequered history, but the last time it came to planning, several members were inclined to approve it, but gave a few recommendations. These suggestions have now been incorporated by the applicant, and in the light of the newly approved local plan, which favours such applications, I see no reason not to approve. We visited the site, and the piece of land in question is an overgrown, unattractive site, which does nothing to enhance the area. The proposed dwelling does, in my opinion, complete the line of houses currently in situ. It blends in nicely. This is a private road and highways have raised no objections to the entrance slash exit to Highfield Drive. I would ask the committee to approve this application as from what I can see, others of a similar nature in Lexton have been approved. We have to be fair and consistent in our approach. Councillor Lynn Barton. Thank you very much. And now we call Councillor Dennis Willards, please. Who I believe has five minutes. The bill go after four, Dennis. Not that you'll need that, of course. Uh, you, you're so kind, <laughs> Chairman. Um, I, 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 I have um, I have concerns about this particular development. Uh, also, the local residents have uh, particular concerns. Uh, and uh, I've, I may well be digressing off planning policy into what I would call planning common sense, uh, Chairman. Uh, but the access road, uh, the private drive, uh, is causing a degree of concern. As you all have seen on your visit, Chairman, it's a single track road where it where it meets Lexton Road. It gets a little wider uh, as one gets nearer to the developments of one uh, one to three but it's essentially single track and there used to be a good policy that um, where you had a, a sort of a single track uh, access road abutting the highway there should really be no more than about five houses um, there are six already this would take you up to seven uh, and those of us who read the uh, planning applications will note that there is yet another application coming in um, which is not relevant this evening, uh, but this is what causes the local residents a degree of concern. Lexton Road is, it's not the leafy lane it's often portrayed to be. Uh, it is the A1124 carrying 15,500 vehicle movements uh, a, a day. And here we have this odd little drive um, where vehicles cannot pass each other coming out with no sights play whatsoever. And how 
permission was ever given in the past to have this sort of a, an apartment onto a, a, a major road. I do not know, but it's not your fault, Chairman. But significant concern is being expressed by residents as to what happens when vehicles meet on this single track road and we have vehicles reversing into a very busy trunk road. Um, and and it, it just seems a, a, a nonsensical uh, way. We don't want to see uh, intensification um, of these traffic problems. Now, turning to more stable ground uh, for the uh, uh, for the planning committee, uh, there have been many applications, as were outlined by the planning officer. Uh, on three occasions, these have gone to an appeal by three separate planning inspectors, and. It had been my intention just to summarize what the planning inspectors had said, but that is already included in the report. And I think the planning inspectors, the government planning inspectors have made the case for no further development uh, along this private drive much better than, than I could do. So I will not go and repeat just what they have said. I would just draw the attention of members to the fact that, that the borough, as it was then, planning committee have turned down developments on, on this site on several occasions. The planning inspectors have confirmed that that was the right decision. Uh, I would therefore ask you, both on the grounds of road safety, and I'm not quite sure where that appears in our policy, and I'm surprised it doesn't, that this there should be no further intensification of buildings on this private drive. And from the point of view uh, of the appearance, the scene, and all the other issues which have been mentioned by the, uh, the planning inspectors, uh, that too confirms that there should be no further development uh, on this drive. So I ask the committee uh, to refuse this uh, this application for the reasons clearly set out by the planning officer, by previous planning inspectors and previous planning committees. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Willett. Um, I have to be on the site visit yesterday. It was um, it was a worry that the, the entrance is, is so small. It was one of the entrances where you have to actually go out into the road to actually see uh, if anything is coming. So therefore blocking the pavement and very busy pavement as well. Um, there was one question I want to ask. It's, it's um, we heard quoted about the new local plan. Does it really change things uh, that we have a new local plan and that it should be your grant and permission? I was going to answer that. Um... I think I might actually start with that. So the um, the policy that is applicable in section two of the new local plan is DM17. And I've compared it to the superseded um, or the out-of-date policy DP15. And they are very, very, very similar, if not the same. So the one um, the one statement that I have highlighted in the report, which I took from DM17, is also in DP15. And that is the following. Additionally, development that would result in the loss of any small incidental areas of open space, not specifically identified on the policies map, but which contribute to the amenity value and the character of existing residential neighbourhoods and any registered common, heathland or village green, or which contribute to green infrastructure will not be permitted. I, I, I believe that with the inspector's decisions, having identified the site as such an important characteristics in that area, this is the main um, main policy of the main policy aspect of the M17 that um, carries weight in this application, and that was also set out in DP15. So, um, the, the despite the new the section two local plan having been adopted, the um, the frame the, the the policy legislation the framework hasn't changed um, to such a degree that would warrant a a, a whole new assessment. Um, there was a couple of other points that I would like to assess. First of all, I do agree there are no issues in terms of sustainability. It is it is accessible. We don't um, we don't say this is unacceptable. We or like I said in my presentation, we don't um, object to the design of the um, of the dwelling. Um, but one thing I would like to so I'm not sure what I'm still sharing. Am I still sharing? Or did you? Um, I, I don't think I am. I would like to show you the. Um, the different um, 
schemes that have been refused. So I'm going to leave it here um, because the agent has made comments about landscaping being introduced in front of the boundary wall. Um, the inspector's decision, the latest one, which dates um, from 2014, um, accepts that landscaping has been proposed because the 2014 appeal is this one here. And you can see here that there's trees proposed in front of the fence. Um, so again, that's something that has already been proposed, but not been found to overcome the major issues. And um, paragraph eight of the inspector's decision says, although the proposals include retention and reinforcement of landscaping on the site, I do not consider any scheme of landscaping which re reduce the harm caused by a dwelling on the site. So it is actually quite clear. And as the um, objector read out, that was again a statement from the inspector, paragraph 10, the inspector said, I consider the principle of erecting a new dwelling regardless of its size or design on the appeal side would be likely to harm the character, quality and appearance of the area. Um, so the inspector has made it very, very clear that the principle is unacceptable and no landscaping can make, make it better. Um, and the new local plan has been adopted since then, but the national planning policy framework has been was adopted in 2014. So they start, that it's not a whole new legislation that we're looking at um, since the appeal dismissal. Um, the site, I do agree, is not looking very tidy. I do think that it has been that that no um, major attempts have been made to keep it tidy. Um, I can show you a photo of. 2020. This was submitted by the applicant as part of a an application for a lawful development certificate. It looks slightly more appealing than it does at the moment. So it can look nice if if there was a willingness to keep it nice. And again, going back to the inspector, the appeal decision in 2011, um, he says um, the site is vacant and untidy, um, but such arguments. Um, and it is suggested that proposals would improve the appearance, but such arguments could easily be replicated elsewhere to justify a proposal that is otherwise unacceptable. And there are other options open to the council if the condition of the site deteriorates. So in summary, um, in, 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 in the officer's opinion, nothing that has been put forward as part of this application introduces any new material that hasn't in some shape or form been tested at appeal before and found unacceptable. Um, in terms of the road, yes, it is a private drive, but the highway authority hasn't objected. Um, uh, it's the, 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 again, sorry, going back to the appeal, the, the inspector at paragraph 13 says, one additional dwelling would not lead to an increase in additional traffic or congest congestion that would justify dismissal of the appeals. Um, the impact of that one dwelling would not be severe enough to refuse plan to have a, a severe impact on the on the surrounding highway network. So there's no there's no support in refusing this application um, from the national planning policy framework. I would stay clear of refusing this application on highway grounds, even though I understand the concerns about it. But it has never been refused on this um, on these grounds, and I would not suggest doing that now. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. I have to read the, uh, the inspector's report is is pretty weighty, in in my opinion, and the site uh, is 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 not to me not suitable for a house. But it's a lovely little area that uh, uh, has a nice bit of greenery to the to the small cul-de-sac. The the road is in pretty poor condition, which is a um needs a lot to maintain that um and more down there would only make it worse but um i'll move it on now to members and uh sam thank you very much chair um i have been sitting on this committee on and off for the last four years and i know for a fact that we have approved applications that are far more contentious than this so i'm going to play devil's advocate um i echo what council barton said but i want to expand on a few points as well and undo councillor willett's um, planning common sense. So there are houses already on this road and I failed to see what one more property would cause, especially on that size. They're all identical along that side. Um, access onto Lexton Road is narrow and constrained. It is, 
but this particular property is, or de development potentially, is right up the other end, not at the junction, so I struggle to see what the connection is. Um, the lots of green space, the other properties have considerable land um, and big green space behind them. They all have gardens, some have front gardens as well. And behind this road, the green space stretches for miles and miles and miles. So the loss of this little patch, I really can't see the difference or the problem. Um, one of the arguments was that the uh, that changes haven't been made since the previous application. They have. Uh, the local plan thing I you've already addressed. Um, the other point I was going to make was about highways, but Nadine, you've covered that. And of course, the city council planning policy doesn't mention anything about it either. So it should not swing our recommendation. So I am going to flip it on his head and I think we should approve it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a, a slide on there. Could members not talk to each other while other members are speaking, please? And we can hear you over here. Thank you. Any other speakers on this? Robert. Yeah, thank you very much, Chairman. Um, yes, as you say, it's uh, had, had a significant and long uh, history of planning applications. Uh, we went to the site visit. It looked it is looking a mess um but actually this house is smaller it's a three bed um the site is slightly raised uh, i think uh, the other picture you showed nadim showed the house on a on a slope um i i believe if that slope was leveled off to road level the house would be down about 5 or 6 foot uh lower and actually it would look it would not be imposing on any other property the other properties have high hedges and are set well back from the road um i think it would it it could be beneficial you've got a nice 1.8 meter brick wall around it there's a grass verge uh after the wall bet between that and the road it it could look a lot more attractive and actually we need houses in the city um and and it's within walking distance you know it's it's a it's an ideal site for a small house uh it's smaller than the other ones down the road yes but uh, I believe on balance, and and the report also says it's not overlooking anybody. No, none of the windows uh, impose uh, a view onto the other properties. So actually, it it really doesn't affect them in a negative way, apart from the fact uh, it just tidies the site up. So I'd I'd propose that we lowered the site level to road level to minimise its impact, and uh, otherwise I'd uh, be supporting the application. Simon, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, um, it would, of course, be open to members, should they be so minded to approve the application, to impose a condition relating to the finished slab level of the proposed dwelling house. Um, however, I think the situation is rather more complex than that. If members were so minded to move a approval of this site, they would have to demonstrate uh, a material change in circumstance. We have adopted the new local plan, uh, but as Nadine has said, there is a golden thread which runs through the previous local plan policies and the current local plan policies, and there is a communality of approach between the two. Um, in terms of uh, the need to demonstrate a change in circumstance, members would have to demonstrate how the reasons cited by three previous inspectors um, have now been overcome by the current proposal. As Nadine has previously shared with you, um, the schemes are remarkably similar uh, in terms of their generality of approach um, to those which have previously been considered, uh, refused and explored at appeal. Uh, and you would now need to demonstrate um, how there has been a change in circumstance that would overcome those fundamental planning reasons for refusal that were applied by this authority and upheld on appeal on three separate occasions. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you. No, Dean, please. Just in the interest of clarity, um, there was three appeals, there was two inspectors. I know it doesn't really change anything, but one was a joint appeal. So two individual inspectors, three appeals. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of inspectors. Lee, you're up next. Um, I just have concerns about the deterioration of the site um, and what measures, if any, the council has to um, rectify that situation because the difference between as it was and as it is now 
um, is, in my opinion, unacceptable. Uh, Simon on there, there, would you like to speak that one? Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, we do have powers under under the Act, under Section 215 of the Act for untidy land and buildings, should the condition of the site deteriorate to such an extent that it poses a um, a threat to um, to amenity, we could um, seek to uh, ensure that the site was brought back to a good condition uh, using the powers that are available to us. As the inspector previously commented, if neglect were to be a grounds for granting planning permission, we'd encourage every citizen in the land to neglect their property to gain that consent. So um, I'm sure that that would be something that members would not wish to see. No, I, I, actually, I agree with that. It's, it's got a really horrible um, mental fence has appeared there as well, which makes the site even more I saw. But um, um, Nigel. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, yes, I, I, I am not convinced by the arguments that we should uh, permit development on the site. I've, I've known the site for, for many years and in the dim and distant past, it's part of my then ward I represented. Um, so I'm, I'm very mindful of my knowledge of the area, and I do think it would it would the, the character of that, that particular bit. I know it, I, people are saying it, it is neglected now. Well, that's fine, but as Mr. Kane has just said, that that's no reason to uh, to, to pass a development on it. So I, I'm I'm not minded to to, uh, to accept this argument at the moment um, that we should allow development on it. So uh, that's my position anyway at the moment. Is that a proposal? For if you wish me to, Chairman, I will propose that we accept the recommendation to refuse. Thank you. Uh, is that seconded by anybody? Yeah. Lee, thank you. Martin, you're up next. Sorry, I thought Councillor Pearson had his hand up first. I was first, was I? Oh, okay. um, yeah. Um, for me, this is more finely balanced than I think the report portrays it as. Um, I wondered whether I could get some clarification on when the last iteration of the National Planning Policy Framework came into being, and um, in terms of date, time, and whether 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 um, paragraph one hundred was different from the previous iterations. Um, I'd like some clarity on that because, and where that fits in time in terms of the, the last inspector's findings. Um, and um, in terms, well, I think it's already been said, this is close to the town center. You can walk into the town center. Therefore, my understanding of previous applications We've passed um, the need for uh, for parking on site is basically is basically not so great, and if my memory serves me right, in some urban areas we've even passed them without parking. Um, so that is an issue. Um, if in terms of it being a cramped site, um, and I think this does make effective use of land in terms of meeting housing need which is which is something that the national planning policy framework says but it does say providing um pro providing it safeguards and improves and improves the environment and i think that's where the fineness of the balance is probably much more clearer in that the inspector has said the inspector's comments which are down there in sort of black and white um and the land is clearly can't help but be improved but as simon has pointed out you've got to be careful you don't create a perverse incentive in terms of the condition of the land um i do think in terms of the houses design it is more beautiful than what is there um if you look at the houses that come down the line, because of the um, the time period in which they were developed, they've got some ugly pipes sticking out the side that are running down the side of the property, and clearly a new build 
would clearly not have that. There seems to be some actual actual ornation on the plans, um, which are more decorative than what than what I could see from the photographs. So for me, this is more finely balanced than I think comes out in the report and clarification on the latest iteration of the MPF in terms of date and how that corresponds with inspectors' findings and whether it's a change from previous iterations is going to be an important factor for me in helping me make up my mind whether I would support the application or not. Chris. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm mindful of the fact that there are around the city, um, there have been over the years many similar infill developments. Um, but I'm also mindful of the history of applications for this site. And if we were to overturn the um, proposal by our officer on this occasion, I'd need to have some very clear reasons for doing so. And if we look at the guidance that we have in, in our um, agenda every, every time, it's quite clear that we need to, if we come to a decision, and I'm quoting, contrary to the officer's recommendation, the committee must specify full reasons for concluding its view, the various issues considered, the weight given to each factor and the logic for reaching the conclusion. And I have to say that thus far, from anyone who's suggesting that we do take a contrary view to our planning officer, I haven't seen those four criteria actually met. So I'd like to hear from those who think we should, whether that's the case. If not, I'm minded to... Uh, support the officer's recommendation. Uh, well, actually, the next step, we have a proposer and a seconder, so I believe that it takes precedence that we now have to put that to the vote. I haven't had any other... On a point of order, I did ask, I did ask for some clarification. Sorry, we'll have the clarification. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I think... Um... Uh, Councillor Warnes raised an issue relating to the MPPF. The latest iteration of the MPPF is 20th of July 2021. Um, I can't recall the particular point that Councillor Warnes was making. Do you think you could refresh my memory, please, Councillor? Thank you. Yeah, I was referring to paragraph 100. And you've, uh, you, um, it's, yeah, I see that you look confused over that, but it does actually relate to the effective use of land. Um, and um and um it is in my understanding promoting the effective use of land in order to meet housing need providing it safeguards and improves the environment so i was wanting to know whether that is the same paragraph that was in the previous iteration given that the uh given the timing of the of the previous inspector's findings Nadine. thank you Nadine. Um, so I believe it's not paragraph 100. Paragraph 100 is unrelated to this application. Um, it is um, to do with public rights of way. So um, if you could maybe look up the paragraph you're referring to or what, um, um, which um, framework you're looking at in terms of dates. I do have a couple of other points to make, please. Um, and I think it does um, relate to the effective use of land as well. A couple of comments have been made that the development doesn't um, impact or harm neighbouring occupiers. That is correct. We have identified that it doesn't, but it harms the visual amenity of the area. Um, so as you come down Highfield Drive at the moment, you've got numbers one, two and three, and then you go around the bend and this is open. So you've got built development and you go around the bend and it's open. And that is a characteristic that is um, contributing towards the visual amenity of the area as has been identified by the inspector. So um, it has an open feel, it is verdant in character. And if now there's a two-story dwelling there with a brick wall, that will change the character of this area. And that is why we believe that um, 
it is unacceptable. So it may not harm neighbours, but it harms the visual immunity of the of, of, of the surrounding area. Um, you say it's more finely balanced than, um, than you think the report is. I just want to say um, all of these recent decisions and appeal from the local authority and the, the, the planning inspectorate, they are material planning consideration. We have to give um, great weight to them. And I believe I had one more point. Um, um, yes, the um, with, it was it was similar. July twenty twenty one may have I've got the committee report. So the latest refusal came to committee. I haven't got the dates. Um, I've got the minutes though. Um, just give me two seconds. Um, So it came to here we go. It came to committee on July, July 2020, 8th of July 2021. So it may have been the latest reiteration of the framework or the one before. But notwithstanding this, the appeal decision was based on the local plan. Local plan policies, post strategy policy you are two, and development plan policy DP1. They have been superseded or um, um they, they are now section. One policy SP seven, um, section two plan policy um, DM seventeen and DM fifteen. Um, so, not a lot of emphasis was put on the framework in the appeal decision. So, the new framework wouldn't necessarily change um, that much because it was the local plan policies that let um, well that were referred to in the refusal here. So, I hope that just provides a little bit more clarity. Thank you for that. That's um, that's a fairly comprehensive answer. Um, it was my bad. Um, I had my book closed and I was trying to recall a paragraph from memory. It is in fact paragraph one one nine, and that says that planning policies and decisions should promote an effective use of land in meeting the needs of homes and other uses, while safeguarding, improving the environment, and ensuring safe and healthy living conditions um so unless i've misunderstood the hierarchy of planning i thought the mppf is is, is higher up the hierarchy than the local plan and the local plan has to conform to the mppf um so if you so it's in my mind it's about the dates and whether this whether paragraph 119 differs from the previous iteration if it doesn't then fine you know it's um i can see the point being made but if it does then i need to understand what the changes are and what the nuances are and how that may impact upon upon the decision that the previous uh, that the inspector made which i'm still not sure whether that was earlier than the later latest iteration of you know the mppf or not thank you simon Thank you. Um, very quickly, um, there are various policy objectives set out within national policy in the framework. Many of those seemingly conflict with one another, and one has to read the framework as a whole rather than picking, cherry picking, if you like, things that meet a particular argument. So, for example, in this case, we could refer you to paragraph 99, which states existing open space should not be built on unless, and then there's um, a list of criteria there. Um, so it's always possible to find things to justify a position within the framework. In terms of the hierarchy of weight, we have a statutory duty, which is quoted in the Dean's report under section 38.6 of the Planning and Compulsory Purchase Act, to determine applications in accordance with the development plan. Now your development plan is the adopted Colchester then borough, now obviously city, um, a local plan 2017 to 2033. And the Dean has identified for you the relevant policies within that plan that this is contrary to. We've also identified that there is a common thread of those policies in terms of the, even the direct wording from the previous reasons for refusal and the reasons for refusal that's now recommended. So in terms of your officer's recommendation, there is no material change in in the nature of the policies 
between the old plan under which previous applications were determined and the current plan insofar as it would be relevant to treat this space differently. Um, it is correct to say that there could be a material change in circumstance when a new plan is adopted, but details of the relevant policies are common to both the old adopted plan, which is now defunct, and the new development plan. So in terms of your statutory duty, your statutory duty is to determine this application in accordance with your local plan. That must be the starting point for your consideration. If there had been a material change in circumstance, so say this site had been covered in, in magnificent trees, which had been felled in a great storm and, uh, and the site rendered barren, that would be a material consideration. So we've no longer got trees on the site. But the fact remains that this is still the same site with the same relationship to its surroundings, making the same contribution to the street scene, although slightly more unkempt. So your officers are advice to you is that there has not been a material change in circumstance sufficient to warrant um, a change in view, or indeed um, there are no material reasons to warrant setting aside of your relevant local plan development policies. So um, I will hand you over to Nadine unless she has anything else to add to that argument. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, the, the framework pre-July 2021 was February 2019, and paragraph 119 was paragraph 117, and the wording is identical. Um, thank you for that. That clarifies, that clarifies the points that I was raising. Thank you. Thank you. So um, we have a proposal and seconder to go with the officer's recommendation. I haven't had a proposal or seconder for refusal. And if you do that, then we expect to hear good planning reasons for why. I think that we've heard tonight from the officers that that's a little crime. I think we should go with refusal because I don't think we've had enough clarity on the reasons for. Uh, we have a plan in place. If we're going to put a bulldozer through that, it will stand for nothing for all future developments. So I think we need to stick to what we know and what we, you know, all our rules and regulations. And then as and when something comes up that is acceptable, then we will have it to the table and we can discuss it. But at the moment, I think we... We owe it to everybody who's worked hard on that plan to do due diligence to it. Robert. Um, yeah, Chairman, I'd, I'd just like to say that, uh, you know, on balance, you know, a, a house there really, you know, would fit in quite well and it'd be convenient and everything else. I hear what the officers are saying. Um, I've never in my 20 or 20 plus years on planning and other, other committees, I've never heard of such a strong defence. And if nothing else, it gives a, gives a warning to all applicants that if you continue to uh, apply for a change, uh, it just uh, loads it against you. And yet it seems such a shame when the, this is actually quite a useful site that wouldn't impact dramatically on many people, if anybody. Uh, so I'm I'm disappointed, uh, but I hear the officer's strong recommendation that we need to. I mean, I wondered, you know, do we defer it and ask the officers to come back with no. uh, ideas? No. But um, I think, yeah, I got that. I got that gist. <laughs> but th thank you for the advice. I, I believe that um, the weight behind this site is huge. Three plan inspectors. Refusals, refusals, refusals. It's just too much in there for me. So we have um, a proposal and a seconder in favour of... Oh, I was just about to get away with it. I'm going to take one more councillor's query and then we go on to the vote. No, Chair, I don't wish to undermine your authorities, Chair. You clearly want to get on with business. That's fine. Absolutely. But I'm happy to, for you to make your point. If it's a quick one, and it's just a sharp question. Um, it's not a question. It's just to say that I'm highly sympathetic with the views that Robert has said, but he's also pointed out, and I think it is fair that, that you know, the officers have made a very clear case, which is clearly demonstrates the 
weight the weight against it. So I um therefore I just wanted to make that point. Thank you very much, Martin. So okay, so now Nitty. Nitty. I just want to ask that if you put it to members, can you ask for a second reason for refusal to be introduced, um, which is the absence of a legally binding mechanism to secure developer contributions, please? Okay, I think that's acceptable. Is that acceptable to propose and second that? Yes, okay, we're happy to do that. Make a note of that, please. So now we move to the vote of office recommendation, which is refusal with the other condition that they uh, asked for. So all those in favour of refusal, raise your hands. That's eight. So eight. Those against? One. And no abstain. One abstention. Thank you very much for that. It was a very long and detailed one, very complicated as well. So that concludes the meeting for tonight. Thanks everyone for attending. And thanks to the member of the public for coming along and sticking with us. Good night, everyone. Have a safe journey.